It's the Mike Francesa Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the Mike Francesa Podcast as we get ready for uh, divisional playoff weekend, widely regarded as uh, the best NFL weekend of the year for many, many fans. I mean, I'm not one that subscribes to that. I'm always a believer in uh, Sunday at 1 and the regular season. But for the playoff weekend, it doesn't get any better than two games Saturday, two games Sunday, all the best teams in action, and that's what we have with the four big games this weekend. Let me update you where we are right now. Uh, The Texans visit Baltimore, and the Ravens are a nine-point favorite. The Packers, who are getting a lot of support and a lot of love, so is their quarterback, um, no pun intended. Uh, They are nine-and-a-half-point underdogs to the uh, 49ers, who are the favorites to win it all. Uh, The Buccaneers, off their big win, six-and-a-half-point underdogs to the Lions in Detroit. And then the classic matchup, the Chiefs, two-and-a-half-point underdogs, which means these teams are dead even. That's just for the home field. At Buffalo, uh, the winner will – this is a classic game, and the winner will probably play a classic game against Baltimore to see which one goes to the Super Bowl. But these teams know each other so well. These quarterbacks know each other so well. They have played many times, and obviously they will meet once again. And this is a matchup where if you played it 10 times, they'd come out 5-5. We know that. Buffalo is hurting defensively. Chiefs are stronger defensively, but Buffalo's home. Finally, the Chiefs have to play a road playoff game in the AFC, and we'll see how they fare in that regard. That's the 6-30 game on Sunday. So 4.30 Saturday, followed by the primetime game in San Francisco. 3 o'clock Sunday, followed by the uh, 6.30 start for the Chiefs and the Bills. And amazing, folks, how the playoffs are such a stage that they change perceptions overnight. One game changes things dramatically. Just look since last weekend at the response for these four quarterbacks. Stroud, off his win, not only came off the first year adage, first year coach, first year quarterback, moved along, but now has been recognized fully off his playoff performance against Cleveland as a budding franchise player. And then you have Jordan Love, who a month ago nobody talked about, despite the fact he was already, after week 11, on his way to playing the best quarterback of anybody in the league since week 11. He's been the top quarterback in the sport since week 11. But off that game against Dallas, if you have people right now name the top five quarterbacks, I guarantee you, there's a chance Love might edge Allen for second place. That's how highly regarded he is right now off this brilliant performance, and it was brilliant against the Cowboys. At the same time, look how far Dak Prescott and Hurts have fallen in the eyes of the nation's fans. People talking now about how they have figured Hurts out, how he's not that effective a passer despite the fact he was without one of his two top receivers. And Dak Prescott, who continues to fumble and bumble his way through the postseason, off a year where many people regarded him the favorite for many, many weeks for the, for the MVP, now being knocked from coast to coast. So the descent of Dak, the descent of Hurts, the enormous rise of Stroud and the incredible explosion that is Jordan Love's fame shows you just how amazing it is in the postseason where legends are instantly made and legacies are instantly shattered because it is the biggest of stages. Not only is everybody watching, the league's watching. Everyone who is a part of the league watches. And everyone is zeroed into the same game, and the importance of these games make reputations. Love is now a star. If you had a vote right now of people and said, who would you start your franchise with the quarterback for the next 10 years? If you did a national poll, I guarantee you he would not finish worse than second. 
a month ago, he might not have been in the top 10. That's how quickly it changes. Now, does it go away in an instant if he throws four picks this week? No, but it takes a big hit. That's how fleeting this is. But let's be honest. Stroud and Love are going to be around for a long time. A long time. They are the real goods. They are going to be fixtures just like we knew that Mahomes and Allen were going to be fixtures. And they have been year after year. The one difference, Allen's still looking for a Super Bowl or a Super Bowl visit. And Mahomes has been there, done that, and already has two rings to wear on his fingers. And is looking, hoping, searching for a third. We learned that Mike Tomlin, despite all the talk, him storming out of the press conference, etc., that he will... He will quarterback, I mean, he will coach, and he'll quarterback, but he will coach the Steelers next year. So he will be back, okay? Uh, He will be back as, I think, expected. I mean, we knew he was on the contract for one more year. I expect, I expect that he will sign a new contract and he has decided that he will continue to uh, remain the fixture in Pittsburgh. As for Belichick and Harbaugh, Belichick has been through Atlanta. Harbaugh has been through the Chargers and, and Atlanta. We have not heard anything out of Dallas. So I would think right now, that you would expect Belichick in Atlanta and Harbaugh with the Chargers. I think that's logically what's going to happen here. Could be a couple of twists and turns. I don't know if the Cowboys intend on entering this in any way. Or do does Jerry has Jerry made up his mind about McCarthy, if he does, does he have someone that he's eyeing for the job? Things in Dallas usually don't stay quiet. They've stayed quiet so far. While Belichick clearly is the object of Atlanta's desire, and everything you hear is that the Chargers and Harbor are moving in the right direction. Now you're hearing the other names, and You're going to see teams wait for certain guys who are still in the playoffs. That's going to happen. That's expected. So as these teams are eliminated, you will see guys move into their slots, and some teams will sit and wait for Ben Johnson, for some of the other coordinators who are still participating and will be in action this weekend uh, across the land Now, Jason Kelsey retires. I don't think he's going to change his mind. Another big change in Philadelphia. Uh, Both Kelsey's are going to wind up in the Hall of Fame. We know that. I don't know what their future holds as far as broadcasting or anything else. We'll see. One is still playing. He's still playing this weekend, and he'll be back next year. The other finally has called it quits, and... Playing center as long as you have, you get very beat up. And he has played center for a very long time. He has been a fixture in the uh, Pro Bowl, which isn't what's important. He's been a fixture on the All-Pro team, which is important. And like I said, he will one day join his brother in Canton. They will both uh, find their way there. So we get ready for this very, very pivotal divisional playoff weekend where you have, I think, some pretty live dogs. Kansas City, Buffalo, I don't consider anybody an underdog. I think Tampa has a shot. I think Green Bay has a shot. I think the Texans have less of a shot, but I wouldn't call it zero. I would have called Pittsburgh's chances in Buffalo zero. 
I don't call the Texans' chance zero. I think Green Bay needs to be respected the way they're playing right now. And you gain momentum. I mean, the, the numbers will show you. The one seeds, if you're talking point spreads, the one seeds do not do well in tandem on this weekend. They are, you do much better betting both underdogs than you do betting both favorites in these two games. Much better against the point spread. Not even close over the last 20 years. Not even close. Emails when we come back. You're listening to the Mike Francesa podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Send your emails to Mike Francesa podcast at gmail.com. Remember, we're brought to you by the good folks at Bet Rivers. Download the ever improving Bet Rivers app for all of your wagering needs for your chance to win their squares game and see if you can pick up 10,000 parlay wager. Uh, always innovative, always updated. So check it out. Uh, the Bent Rivers app, and of course, the program brought to you, as always, by uh, Bent Rivers. Now, as we said, Mike Francis, a podcast at gmail.com. Andy starts us off. Uh, Andy, has this season at all changed your opinion of Todd Bowles as a head coach? Well, first of all, let me say this I've known Todd Bowles a long time. I like him as a person, I always have. He's a good man, nice man, good man. I've always thought of him as more of a coordinator than a head coach. But you know what? He's earned the right to run this Tampa franchise. They can't be upset with what he's done here. He's an individual playoff weekend. He and Baker have done the job this year, so they deserve to stay there, and they will stay there in Tampa. He's not my favorite head coach. There are worse. There are surely better. But uh, I'm happy to see him have some success. Uh, Brian, looking back at the Jets coaches the last 40 years and excluding Bill Parcells, would you rank Rex Ryan the best? Um, I would have to rank him the most successful because of the trips to the AFC title game. But I would say the mistake, and again, I do not put this on Woody. I put it on Eric. But the worst thing that ever happened to the Jets was the poor relationship between Mangini, who had not yet grown up and was his own worst enemy. He didn't know how to deal with the media. I had a very good relationship with him, but he did not deal well with the TV people. He did not deal well with the media as a, as a whole. He did not deal well with the national media, and he did not deal well with his own front office and his own owner. And you know what? You can't do that as a young coach. Remember, when you look there, Mangini had two winning years out of three and got fired. He got fired because they were 8-3 and three and finished 9-7. and seven. And frankly, he got fired because he shot his big mouth off at the owner, and he shouldn't have. I've always felt that one of the really untapped talents is Mangini. He jumped in too quickly for his second job, and then it went south, and now you don't get a third shot. And I'm telling you, if I had had a team, I would have hired Mangini to be the coach, and he'd be there for 15 years. You know why? Because he's a really good coach. But he had to grow up. And I think he finally did, but it's too late. And it's, too, and it's kind of sad because he could have been one of the really successful coaches of this generation. So he would have been my choice. Jack, in all of the years covering the NFL, have you ever seen a GM start a career as badly as Joe Douglas has with the Jets? And then turn it around and find success. All right, listen, it's been a tough go. Have I seen it happen where guys have turned it around and been successful? Yes. Hey, listen, if you've been around the NFL as long as I have, I've been around it over 40 years, you've seen everything happen. Guys be terrible early, be great late. Guys be surprising early and be bad late. Guy, everything we've seen, front office, coaches, assistants, you name it. But... Um, this is a pivotal year for the Jet hierarchy. This is it. The only reason they are getting another year. Three losing lousy seasons like they've had usually gets you bounced. And it hasn't because of the stability that Aaron Rodgers demands. Okay, I understand that. But I'm telling you, 
Joe Douglas has to spend every waking hour finding a way to build and using every resource to build an offensive line. I don't care about getting that flashy second wide receiver. I can find a wide receiver. Guys find wide receivers. You want me to show you how many guys found good wide receivers on the third, fourth, and fifth rounds last year in the draft? Look at Nakua. Look at Tank Dell. Go down the line. There's a million of them. Don't think you have to spend your resources on a wide receiver. You have to spend them on the offensive line, and you can't make mistakes. That is what is going to make or break this this general manager and this coach, whether or not they build the offensive line and keep Aaron Rodgers healthy. If they don't, they leave. John, do you think Buck deserved another year? I do. Stearns, in my opinion, has been a disaster. Now you have two different roads here. Number one, should Buck have got another year? I don't think he needed one. I don't think he demanded one. I don't think he did a great job. Buck is a great baseball man. He has been for a very, very long time. Things went very sour. And the thing that's dismaying is how people badmouth how they worked and how they prepared, because that's not Buck's show off the baseball. So there were a lot of weird things around that team last year that just don't make a whole lot of success. I mean, a whole lot of sense. As far as Stearns, I'm taking a wait-and-see approach. Have I liked Anything he's done yet? No, I think he's botched everything he's touched. But I do agree with his premise that let me sit back and look at this team for a year to see exactly what I need. I don't think that's dumb. He didn't have to run in and throw his owner's money around just because it's there. Because when you throw it around in a big way, it impacts not one year, it impacts five years. Even if you are the wealthiest owner in baseball. So... The idea of taking a wait-and-see approach is not a bad idea, but they have no starting pitching. Ryan, with the NFL streaming a playoff game exclusively on Peacock this year, do you think it's within the realm of possibility in the coming years for the Super Bowl to be on pay-per-view? Absolutely not. It will never happen in, I don't know how old you are, Ryan, it won't happen in your lifetime. It won't happen in my lifetime. It won't happen in the unborn's lifetime. Congress will never allow championship games in America be played on pay TV. That will never happen. They will always be played on free TV unless there isn't free TV. That might change the dynamic, but I think we're still a long, long way from that where there's no free TV. Uh, For as long as there is free TV, there will be free championship games in America. That will never happen. But the NFL will continue in any way possible to grab every dollar and squeeze every dollar out of the best fan base that any sport could ever dream of having. They have 100 million Auden fans. That is insanity. It's, It's beyond the realm of a league's comprehension. And it is a golden goose that just keeps on giving. And they take with every hand, then they turn the goose upside down, then they squeeze it, then they do whatever they can to get every, every golden coin out of it. And they could care less about you, me, or anybody else who is a fan of the sport. Aaron, what are the odds Saban joins Belichick as a consultant on his staff? Nil. They are very close, but... Saban is above being anybody's anything. He is a king. Once you are a king, you don't go backwards. So he can only wear the crown. He can't take a menial job. He can't take an underling job. He can't get in line behind anybody else. The line starts with him. Just like the line starts with Belichick, the line starts with Saban. There's no other way at this point. Tariq, I think the Knicks are one player away from a legitimate chance at a title. I think that's true if you give me the one player, but he'd have to be a pretty good player. And in in my regard, you'd have to ship Randall to get him, which is a good thing for me, but I'm not a Randall guy. But the odds of that happening are nil. Um, Who do you think can replace IQ's production? You know, IQ left a 
very big void because the Knicks have had to do things a little differently because they don't have the punch on the second unit, which is necessary. They move guys around. They move Dante to the starting rotation. They had to split more time for Randall and Brunson so that one of them's on the floor so that they have the primary store. But if you've noticed, since the trade, McBride has stepped up as a scorer. He's had four games of 15 or more points. He's had four games of three or more threes. He looks like he could maybe fill that scorer role, and right now he's doing that. If he can be a scorer, a point-a-minute scorer when he comes in the game and can be someone who can make threes, as he has shown in recent games, maybe he can fill that void and they don't have to go out and get that scorer. So sometimes when you trade someone, you open an opportunity for someone. And clearly McBride has jumped through that opportunity so far. Now it's only a handful of games. You want to take it with a grain of salt, but you are seeing significant offensive improvement from him in these games. And it at least bears watching right now. And if he can do what, it, what he's done in recent games, well, then he fills a very, very big void offensively for them. And they clearly have a lot more cohesion and a better balance with a vastly superior defensive player now in the starting lineup. And he is a terrific defensive player. So the addition of a, of a really good defensive player who has developed an offensive game because of his ability now to knock down a, a, a three um, has changed their chemistry for the better. And if McBride's going to pick up the second unit, that's a big positive. A very, very big positive. And plus, if Robinson comes back, that's a, they need size. But I'll tell you, I'm... Stunned by how well Hartenstein's played. He has really, he, Hartenstein's played terrifically. He really has. I mean, uh, you know, some guys, when you give them more minutes, you break them. That has not been the case. It really hasn't in any way. So we will have the divisional playoffs. I was four and two in the postseason, uh, I mean, in the playoffs last week against the spread. I uh, lost on. Uh, Cleveland, I went back and forth on that game a hundred times, and I finally went with the Browns, and I kicked myself. And then I lost the Lions, which I thought I should have won. I, I just think they screwed up the second half. I thought they were the better team. Um, neither team was good defensively, but I thought they were the better team at home. I thought they just didn't handle the second half well. Um, so 4-2 and two against the spread last week, and we'll do the games on Friday. Uh with our regular Football Friday podcast for Divisional Playoff Weekend. And after that, you just have three games left, two on Championship Sunday, and then the craziness of Vegas. And I still uh, cannot, cannot imagine what Super Bowl week is in Vegas. One thing that's very hard, though, is if you're on early in the day in the East, say, uh, as a broadcaster on Radio Row, it's a very tough time for producers and to plan shows because it's very early in the morning there. And when we used to have shows on the West Coast or in Arizona for Super Bowls, it was such a pain in the neck because you were going to work in the dark. And it was hard to get, get people up in the morning there. They didn't want to get up in the morning. So, you know, it's hard. You have to really work hard to schedule people in advance. There's not a lot of people walking around that time in the morning if you, you know, of course, there's a big time difference between Vegas and, say, the East Coast. Um, the other thing is this. I would just warn someone. I know a lot of fans a lot of times go out to a Super Bowl without tickets, looking for tickets, or go out trying to get into events and all different things. Be very careful. Unless you are someone who goes to Vegas a lot, and you have a relationship with a hotel, or you are a serious high roller, or you happen to play in the NFL, you are going to stand on a lot of lines in Vegas. It is going to be very hard to get accommodated anywhere. It's going to be a, some towns, I think there's going to be a lot of 
headaches and nightmarish stories. Like I knew when the NFL went to Jacksonville, it had no chance to put a Super Bowl on in Jacksonville. It was an utter disaster. The town wasn't big enough. Some towns just aren't built for a Super Bowl. I'm not sure Vegas is. Now, in one regard, it clearly is. And then the largesse of Vegas and the largesse of the Super Bowl colliding is almost, you know, almost must see. But the average person who goes out there and tries to be a part of everything will find himself on the outside looking in of a lot of events. It will be a tough week for that person. We'll see you later. Thanks for listening to the Mike Francesa podcast on the Bet Rivers Network.